I'm Anne-Marie Lipinski, the curator of the Neiman Foundation for Journalism, and on behalf of Neiman and um, our good colleagues at Harvard University's Asia Center, welcome. We're so glad to have all of you here. Uh, the resume facts of Maria Ressa's career are impressive enough. Princeton cum laude, Fulbright Fellow, CNN Bureau Chief in Manila and Jakarta, CNN's Chief Investigative Reporter in Asia, author of two books on terrorism, news division head at the Philippines' largest media and entertainment company, and eight years ago, a founder of Rappler, one of her country's leading digital journalism sites. It has been her work at Rappler that has since catapulted Maria into a role she did not choose, but has managed with fearlessness, strength, grace, and wisdom. Rappler's journalism exposing corruption and conflicts in President Duterte's government, including Duterte's extrajudicial killing campaigns, has attracted not just the enmity of the government, but the full force of its retaliatory powers. There are at least seven cases being tried in court against Rappler, against Maria, the news site's CEO and executive editor, against Rappler's directors, against a former researcher. The charges range from tax evasion to cyber libel, all of them expensive and potentially devastating to the publication and to its founder. She has been arrested twice some weeks she spends as many as four days in court on separate trials, and she faces significant prison time should she be convicted. Duterte and what are now familiar echoes from other global leaders has repeatedly attacked Ressa and Rappler and said he desires to, quote, kill journalism in the Philippines. Just because you're a journalist, he said, you are not exempted from assassination if you're a son of a bitch. In addition to investigating the president and his government, Rappler has exposed the insidious role that Facebook played in promoting disinformation in the Philippines and what Maria calls a cascade of lies that have undermined the democracy. She has been as assertive in confronting Mark Zuckerberg and other social media forces as she has the government. And do not think that this is only a story about Rappler or the, United, or the Philippines. I think the biggest problem that we face right now is that the beacon of democracy, the one that stood up for both human rights and press freedom, the United States, now is very confused, she says. What are the values of the United States? In including Maria in its 2018 Person of the Year cover, Time Magazine wrote that Rappler has turned into a global bellwether for free, accurate information at the vortex of two malign forces. One, the angry populism of an elected president with authoritarian inclinations. The other, social media. And this just in, that work earned her a new honor today. Maria has been named one of Time's 100 most influential women of the past century. I am incredibly honored to introduce. I am incredibly honored to introduce uh, a personal hero and a friend. Please welcome Maria Ressa. Maria, thank you for that, and thank you for being here. It's so great we finally got you to campus. Thanks for having me, yeah. and thank you for coming. I forgot to start with that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was thinking about how to um, structure a conversation, and just so people know, we're going to just spend a little time starting a conversation, and then um, we're going to invite those of you who have questions to um, uh, go to the microphones. There are two of them in the back of the room, and um, you'll be able to um, also uh, talk to Maria directly. I, uh, so I, 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 I'm not sure if this is new, but I was just noticing on your um, Twitter bio that it's just you've You've had, you have a string of um, nouns, um, idealist, cynic, pragmatist, journalist, author, CEO, rappler. I, I wanted, um, I thought it'd be fun to kind of structure a conversation around those first three. Um, through the prism of um, these eight years or so since you founded Rappler, um, because 
I first met you right at the launch, or right after the launch, and um, I've watched how things have developed, both for your newsroom, um, for your country, and for you uh, personally. And I think those three words kind of form an interesting um, description of that arc. So, idealist. Um, take us back, um, 2011, 2012, um, when you, this idea for Rappler has emerged, you're leaving kind of a secure sinecure, um, and you want to launch this new thing. Can you kind of describe what that idea was and what the conditions were um, journalistically in, Phil in the Philippines? Um, at that point, I headed the largest news group. I had a news group of about 1,000 journalists. And yet, it was so difficult for a legacy news group to pivot in the age of social media, in the age of technology. And so we decided that, uh, look, I had spent six years kind of professionalizing. Well, that's what we were trying to do. Because I decided when I turned 40, I was going to go home to the Philippines. And I was old enough to have real experience. I'd spent 20 years with CNN. And I, yet I was young enough to have enough energy to want to still change the world, right? It's a good, that 40 is a good age. Um, after six years of, of, when you have a huge news group, your end goal for management is efficiency and managing for efficiency. So when I walked into ABS-CBN, I actually took every single major task of the journalist in, in that network, and I assigned an industrial engineering student to follow every person. So we became efficient, right? This is not the world of social media, of tech. And you, you have to create conditions where people will create instead of becoming efficient. So by 2010, by, yeah, by 2010, we had, we had made the company efficient, and then it was about making money, and I kind of got bored with that. This is the problem with journalists. You know, we're not very good at making money, and making money is boring, um, but that's what drives. So let's talk about the new gatekeepers like tech, right? When you see Facebook go from $49 billion to $69 billion in a year's time in terms of income, Journalists have to make difficult choices to protect the public sphere that would go against business. This is one of those times that will confront uh, a platform. Sorry, I, re I went off. But why did we set up Rappler? Because it was clear something was changing, that we needed to take investigative journalism, combine it with technology to build communities of action. That's what we wanted to do. I was tired of throwing stories into a black hole we wanted impact. So you can kind of say that beginning in 2012, Rappler was an activist organization, right? Because we believed that journalism changes the real world. We weren't sitting there trying to choose political sides, but we certainly did. The news agenda, we knew climate was a huge story. That was the top of our news agenda. Good governance. We were probably the only news group in the Philippines that looked at the SDG goals and actually did that as an editorial agenda because that's incredibly important. Um, that was the idea for Rappler. To, and we started, we went from managing 1,000 journalists to 12 people. And the, the people, there were four or five of us above 40 at that point in time. That was eight years ago now. And uh, Glenda Gloria, our managing editor, managed the 24-hour cable station of the network that I managed. And uh, she was a Neiman Fellow two years ago when, I, when all the cases were being thrown against us. So thank you for letting her come home when I needed her. Um, but that's, that's the first, was to realize that the world had changed, that Filipinos were young, and we wanted to use the technology to come to them. We did really well. Within a year and a half, we grew from 12 to 75. The money that we raised at the very beginning, uh, I, I don't mind telling you, I, all I did was I raised $2 million at that point, a lot my own, right? We, we came in with our own money, because we decided that uh, the time was right, right? And that it, this was a time to experiment. And we figured, if it didn't work, we'll go back to our old jobs. And if it did work, then wow, how fun would that be? And one of the characteristics of Rappler is that it was very young and pretty female. 
63% women, median age, is our median age of our country, 23 years old. We didn't do that on purpose. We keep looking for men, so please come. <laughs> you can apply. So why do you think that happened? Why that demographic? So I, in journalism in general, the major news groups were led by women. Um, and part of that, you know, and I don't know if this is happening in the United States, but part of that was because uh, journalists were paid less. Right? So many men, like people who I was reporters with in, in the local news groups, said that they had to leave journalism once they began having families. We still ha live in a kind of macho society, uh, even though women are strong. Think about it like this. Um, Stanley Carnow described the Philippines. He's the, he wrote a huge book called In Our Image. He said, the Philippines spent 450 years in a convent and 50 years in Hollywood. Those were our colonizers. <laughs> right. 450 years under Spain, 50 years under the United States, the only protectorate of the United States. So even our constitution is patterned after the United States. We have a Bill of Rights like the United States. But I think the reason why women and now I actually, you know, I knock on wood, the people who apply to Rappler are self-selective. They know they're walking into battle. Um, they know they will work really hard. Um, I still don't really know why. It's, there's so many women. I keep looking for men, like I told you. But um, I know, for example, the day I was arrested, there was one guy we hired that day, in the morning I hired him, and then in the evening he saw me getting arrested and led out of our office. He's still with us, you know. <laughs> so what you're describing is sort of the, I mean, the, the early go-go days were pretty exciting. Um, you're very optimistic. You and remember, like, I would speak not about press freedom, but about innovation in news you know, using technology. We're about to roll out a new tech platform, even while we're under attack, so I'm gonna tell you about that later on. But, you know, you can't just play a defensive game. This is, I think that our information ecosystem has already been destroyed. We've been poisoned already. And now we have to create what the new world is gonna look like. If you're a Neiman Fellow, you are going to have like incredible power to create what this new ecosystem is gonna look like. That's what we feel in Rappler, and I feel like so far, knock on, again, that's not what this one. Um, so far, it's made us be present tense. You know, the best part of doing journalism today is that you cannot do what we used to do in the past. So did you have a sense that Rappler was starting to change journalism in the Philippines? How were your competitors responding? What were kind of the victories that you look back on? I think we were the new kid on the block that everyone hated at the beginning. Because <laughs> we forced all the news groups to walk into social. Imagine, like, my old reporter from the largest network would have a camera like that and they'd be doing and shooting this, and then they would have to then take that, run it to the network, ingest it into the system, and then it'll be a few hours before their story is up. In the meantime, my reporter, this is before there were tripods, we actually created a metal case for our, for our cell phones, and we put it on a tripod, and they would be live. We figured out before Facebook Live, we figured out how to go live, and so we would be live, and our story would be up. We were admired and hated, I think. Um, and it helped that I ran the largest news group, so even our advertisers came with us, right? Imagine being able to do founding advertising packages. Really exciting at the beginning, but I think this also allowed the Philippines to jump start. Because Rappler was there, every news group came on social. After what happened with Facebook, I don't know whether that's good or bad now, right? But um, we definitely changed our ecosystem. But I think that our biggest problem is the old world of competition when we came under attack. Everyone stepped back, right? Because well, it was first the largest newspaper that was attacked by President Duterte. We weren't the first attack. When that large newspaper, the largest newspaper, the Inquirer, was attacked, we all did the coverage they buckled within two weeks and said they would sell this to a crony of President Duterte, 
sorry, I shouldn't say that word because this will be, to a businessman favorable to President Duterte. Um, <laughs> but um, that sale hasn't gone through, right? Then it became the largest television network, ABS-CBN. Uh, President Duterte continuously threatened not to renew their franchise. You know, of course, and last month, he then began attacking ABS-CBN, not only not renewing the franchise, but it's like a machine gun approach. They use the same case against us, against this largest network, which is huge, because when I was there, it was a $450 million market cap company, right? So this, is, this will impact the markets. We were the third attacked. And the reason I think we stood up is because we have no other business interests. The journalists in Rappler, in our shareholders agreement, every shareholder signed something that said that they will give both editorial and economic decision making to the journalists. And so we had no other interests. I have no other businesses um, except journalism. And so we stood up against it. Um, so before we leave Idealist, um, if you could just uh, give us a, a little bit um, more of a description of what you meant by activism by journalism as activism. Look, in the old days, in our time, I remember Amory when she was a reporter, like I was, right? So in the old days, we had very strict rules of the difference between reporting and activism, right? And I would do my best never to be an activist because those were the standards and ethics of that time. But mind you, in the climate, in the climate change problem, right, it also led to problems of false equivalence. Because we say that we're not going to take sides, here's one side, and then we gotta go look for another side, even if the other side isn't equal, right? So there were, there were already all these cracks in our old ways of looking at journalism. But then when it came to the battle for truth, and actually for me, it happened when I got arrested. It was very simple to jump. You move quickly into cynicism here. I'm, I'm, I'm. <laughs> no, but it's not because you know when I got arrested, it became very clear to me that my rights were abused, and it became very clear to me that these charges were trumped, were political harassment. So why should I shut up? I have firsthand experience about it, right? Then it became a problem for the news group. What does that mean? And so we had a huge discussion. We were like. Do we say there's a pro-Duterte and an anti-Duterte? How do we label these? And you go down to this. In the battle for truth, you have to say who lies, right? In these, in these charts, it is overwhelmingly pro-Duterte. In the charts of the United States, the facts show you they were the side of Trump, not Sorry if you're a Republican, not, nothing against you, but the stats of which Facebook accounts are shoving out lies are clear, right? Now, how that impacts and who does it, that's the investigative journalist's work. So what that did for me is it changed my entire view of the world through firsthand experience, and isn't that what journalism is? In the battle for truth, journalism is advocacy because we will fight for the facts. So... Um Again, when I first met you, you were just, uh, I mean, you were just on fire. Rappler was super exciting. Um, you were getting a lot of attention, um, having a lot of success early on. And so we'll pivot now to, to Cynic, um, because things started to happen um, to you, to the newspaper, to your colleagues, to your board. So can you recall the first kind of signs um, the first glimmer that things were changing, um, and you're probably not anticipating it's going to lead where it leads. Sure. But something's happening and something's changing in the country um, in response to the work, the same kind of work, aggressive work Rapper had been doing all along. What, what, when was that, and what, what happened, and why, why did it happen? The first was the campaign period, the end of April, the beginning of May 2016 when a, a student in UP Los Baños in the university asked President Duterte, Mayor Duterte, a question about the extrajudicial killings. That was the first time I saw hate unleashed. Right? So I've told you about patriotic trolling, tamping down a narrative. The other side is doxing that uh, use inciting to hate and violence. 
And we came out with an editorial because that student, there was a Facebook page threatening death. They released his phone number. His family called us and asked for help, right? It was the first time I saw that. And I think our editorial was something like, uh, when the wisdom of crowds becomes a mob or something. I can't remember what it was, but that was the first one. And we called the campaign manager of Mayor Duterte, and that happened on a Friday. By Saturday, we called Facebook. They took it down, that, hate, that page threatening death, right, threatening to kill him. And then uh, by Monday, the campaign manager asked their supporters to calm down. Here's the reality. The social media platforms are behavioral modification systems. And we are Pavlov's dogs walking into these behavioral modification systems, right? When he was targeted, this young, this student, the mob turned. So this plays on the worst of human nature using the distribution that rewards that behavior. This is why you can't say that, you know, by the way, do you want Facebook to be the one to determine what's speech and not? They already have. And what they have distributed are the lies. So you had known the mayor. Yes. Previous to his. I had interviewed him in the 80s, right. like that, as early as that. So were you surprised by this, or were you unsurprised by his behavior? And what was really different was this, the intersection of that kind of behavior with with Facebook with Facebook's power. I think it's the so it's a perfect storm just like in the United States, right? Uh, liberal democracy hadn't had enough of a trickle down effect. And um, and people were easy to incite to anger, especially if the promise of democracy hasn't come to you, right? And what we saw with that perfect storm was a technology that rewarded the spread of anger and hate. The emotion that spreads fastest on Rappler. Remember we had a mood meter in 2012? We were ahead of Facebook in doing this. The emotion that spreads fastest is anger. Here's the other part that we forget. The emotion that spreads second fastest is inspiration. So man, let us find that. I think, anyway, I'll shut up. And, oh, no, I'll, don't <laughs> shut up. Please don't shut up. Um, so I, I, I guess at, at that point, we knew something had drastically changed. I felt it was technology. Technology had enabled the rise of these strongman authoritarian style leaders. It is democracy kind of caving in in plain sight because what happened is once they gain power, like in the Philippines, President Duterte's confidential intelligence funds in the first year, he increased it seven times, right? And then you had these kind of waves of armies on social media, information operations that's meant to manipulate you. Um, just like here in the United States, you got to read the Mueller report because you guys have been manipulated as well. Um, the, that stuff happened. And so without technology, I certainly would have felt safer as a journalist. You know, journalists in the United States and in the Philippines were protected by the Bill of Rights, by our Constitution. The social media platforms rip that protection away from us. And just to bookmark, um, Rappler does kind of begin as a Facebook entity. In I mean, 2012. Yeah. Sorry, in so, 2011, before we launched the website in January, I played with Facebook because I really wanted to understand it. And if it had better search functions in 2011, we may not have launched a website. But I, I saw the imperfections. We also saw we were one of the four news groups they asked to join instant articles. That, to me, is the first sin. Because when news groups flocked to instant articles, the world's largest distributor of news became Facebook. One of the things I think that was um, the most disappointing to me to observe, and I don't know how you felt about it, was to see the way um, journalists, some journalists turned on you and on Rappler. Um, can you describe um, how that ha why you think that happened and what that was like for you and your staff? How candid can I be? Um, Very. <laughs> okay, this one you'll take out. 
I think that um, you can see the word bayaran, corrupt, right? Um, when I was head of ABS-CBN, I took a zero tolerance approach to corruption. Um, during my time period, the restructuring of ABS-CBN, we let go of 21% of our group under a special separation package. And some of that was driven by just not just eliminating fat, but also cleaning up the news group, right? Uh, why, were, why did we come under attack? Because the armies that are created on social media are augmented by real world armies as well, not as much, but people who will attack for an agenda, i.e. they're paid, which is the same thing they would say about me, right? Let me be fair and give you, I, these are um, articles that are written to tear us down, to complement the bottom-up attacks on social media. At the same time, just like um, uh, Tim Snyder said, right, I call them paid, but the description of Rappler in the, in the group that hates us now is that we are paid by oligarchs. Right? It's not true. I can give you our numbers. I can show you where all the money came from and where it went to. But that's the kind of battle we're fighting. So endemic corruption is part of our world. You have institutions that have stood up a lot more. Our institutions crumbled in six months. Um, we have a captured. President Duterte is the most powerful man that we've ever had in history. He didn't have to de declare martial law like Marcos did to create martial law conditions. So I'm still I, out. I, 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 um, I would describe you as a critic and a skeptic, but I, I, I'm surprised to hear you, you use the word cynic. Um, wh where, did that, where do you think that comes from, that self-definition? I, I, this is actually going all the way back. Like when I, when I did the Twitter, thing, the Twitter description, I didn't know how to take decades of, of experience and compress it. It was easy because I, I think I've seen the best and the worst of human nature on coverage. Mm -hmm. I've seen the best, you know, in situations where people don't even have food for their families. They'll give you the food because you're their guest. Uh, in areas which were repeatedly hit by typhoons in the Philippines, disasters in Indonesia, in parts of Asia, the kind of, of hope, the goodness of human nature that bubbled up always was so, um, so empowering. But then the flip side, the worst actions taken against humanity. And let, let's talk here. What's happening now on social media is a scorched earth policy, right? It's a scorched earth policy. And the social media platforms have great incentive to continue making money and very little incentive to protect the users. And I think those are, I'm pretty cynical. That sounds really cynical, right? Um, but that's also, I think, pragmatic. And so we need to find the right incentive to help them get enlightened self-interest. Because in the long term, they're not going to want to live in the kind of governments that they are helping create. And the second one is that they're also not going to want to destroy, ultimately, um, the values they supposedly stand for. At the irony, of course, American social media platforms, um, starting in 2017, the research reports came out that cheap armies on social media are rolling back democracy, right? And by 2019, you're now talking, this is Oxford University, uh, the Computational Propaganda Research Project that said that this is now happening in at least 70, 70 countries around the world. So my last question in this area before I move on to pragmatist is um, when, did you, when did you realize and why uh, that this was more than um, kind of ugly criticism and that the intent was to just stop and destroy? When the cases began. I mean, it's pretty alarming and shocking that the first case in January 2018 without any really due process, which we brought up in the case. I can't discuss them all. But the first case was to shut down Rappler. 
um, I think that shocked everybody, including our friends in the international community. Um, and then, of course, the unthinkable just kept becoming reality, you know, that I would get arrested in my own newsroom, that I'd get detained for being a reporter, for being a journalist. That's incredible. Um, I would say, I feel like Alice in Wonderland and I fell in the rabbit hole and the Mad Hatter's in charge, you know? And I keep thinking, I just have to keep walking through and come out the other side. And that's the pragmatist um, that's, yes. part of you. I mean, that's a great um, transition to that. So I think, um, and you and I have talked about this, I think it's very, I think it's very unusual um, to respond as you have. Um, it's been such a cacophony, right? And at some point, you either instinctively or, um, you know, you go through some process and you intellectually decide that the thing to do is to be as public and loud and persistent about all of this as you possibly can, and not just in the Philippines, but to take this to a world stage, um, which you've been doing now for, you know, in the, for the last couple of years, very consistently, um, was that a, was just was that just a natural impulse on your part, or did it take a lot to come to that decision? Because it's also taken you away from your newsroom. Um, there's been a price to pay for this as well. I showed you the moment of decision, which was when I looked at the natural language processing analysis, and it showed that the crackdown, the rights crackdown, wasn't the way the story was done in the Philippines. And it's calling a spade a spade, right? And if you're in an environment of fear, it's harder to do that. We've moved beyond that now for news groups in the Philippines. But I think at that period of time early on, the whole thing is, why should I stick my neck out? You may be thinking that same thing. Why should you stick your neck out? You got to fight the battle early or you will be too weak to fight it later on. So that was one fact point. But the other part of it is I spent most of my career outside the Philippines. And I knew that I, it was like you stumble into the solution, right? And I think that's, that's the best way to think about it. You have to keep moving forward regardless of what is happening around you. And then if you know that you're making a mistake, you course correct. But the worst thing you can do is to stand still. We have not done that. <laughs> um, oh, we already have, of course, a Neiman fellow with the first question. So if people um, want to um, line up behind the microphones on either side, and uh, when you ask your question, if you could please introduce yourself so Maria knows who she's speaking with. Uh, that would be much appreciated. So Gilson, you want to start? Sure. Yeah. My name is Gusin Harman. I am a Neiman Fellow and a journalist from Turkey. Oh, wow. OK. Uh, hi. Where uh, the most journalists have been jailed, right? Yes, so. unfortunately. Uh, it's been an honor to, be your, to, be, to call myself your colleague. And your definition of activist organization and journalism is advocacy truly resonates with me. You called Filipino democracy as one of the first dominoes. One of the first dominoes, sorry. And as the dominoes keep falling around the world, do you think that as journalists we should redefine and discuss impartiality and neutrality as conditions for reporting change? Thank you. Want me to respond or we'll take yeah. a few? Okay, so thank you for your question. And then let me just say right off the top, I don't believe in impartiality or neutrality. And I'll tell you why. Think about it like this, right? If we were talking to somebody in London and we were describing this room, if I was looking forward, I would describe an audience with a few, with a few seats that are missing. I would describe the three, the three people in front of me. Uh, Filipinos, I think, right? Um, but if you were describing it to someone in London, you would describe two women in black, one woman waving her hands. Uh, you know, if you just think that you only tell, you have blinders on and you can only tell what your perspective looks like, right? And then if, uh, 
if the guy inside the booth or the guy standing, the guy behind the camera, he would have to describe that he's seeing like black bars um, kind of obscuring the woman waving her hand and, and then like this. I can't describe this for you because I don't see it. A good journalist, a good reporter, would go to every single one of those places and give you a context for it. There is no such thing as objectivity, I think. Even when I was with CNN, I used to say that. And you know why? Because I'm a, f so the, the reporter ahead of me in the Philippines was a six foot two white Anglo-Saxon wasp. And then I came in as a reporter in 1986. I was a five foot two Filipino American. The stories we did were radically different. Um, that's important. That's why you need diversity in newsrooms, right? Bina? Um, hi, my name is Bina, Bina Sarwar. I'm a journalist from Pakistan. And everything you said really resonated with me uh, because we've been there with the dictators and uh, we know what it's like. I mean, you can't be just a journalist in a situation when democracy and human rights are under threat. Um, I think what you've done is so powerful. And I'm wondering, I've been talking to journalists in Pakistan about this, um, and a lot of them are young, and they want to do something. They're talking about something, kind of what you've done, but I guess I don't know if they know about it enough or whatever, and I'm wondering if there's ways to you know, have this kind of thing elsewhere as well, what you've done. I, you know, it's nice to hear you say that, but I'm not really sure exactly what that is, except for, you know, we look for solutions. Like, if you think about it, the way the West defined journalism is adversary, adversarial. But in Southeast Asia, right, like, our civic engagement, our move PH, actually worked with government yeah. because... But yet, there was a line between that and our accountability journalism. And that was tough for Philippine government officials to figure out, but they learned what we were trying to do, right? I think that's, I think that I would love to look at how we can redefine what journalism is. In the end, it's kind of similar to governance. We are the check against power. And our goal is not to get power, which is why, you know, I'd be, it's, I'm very hum. I could never prescribe to you which political party to vote for because I wouldn't know. I wouldn't want to be responsible for your vote, but I will tell you what the facts are and then kind of throw the different forces in, try to give you the context, and then you make your call. That's why I believe in democracy. Anyway, long-winded response to I would love to uh, to continue talking, I think that the new journalism that we will build will, uh, unlike the past where a big Western news organization will build bureaus in other parts of the world, I think the way we do it is now we, we come up, bottom up, and come through with the principles and ethics and the mission of journalism. It's local and global. Thank you very much. My name is Rania Abzaid, and I am a Middle East-based journalist and also a Neiman Fellow. Thank you for your talk, and thank you for being on the front line of that battle for truth that you outlined. Um, I've covered, among other things, the war in Syria, where we're not just seeing historical revisionism, but revisionism in real time, where there is an attack, there are yeah. bodies, yeah. and the trolls come and say that this attack didn't happen. You refer to this new information ecosystem, Facebook is obviously a big part of that. Uh, Zuckerberg has made it clear he doesn't care. He doesn't care about fake news or about the fake uh, political ads. And we, the people, are not boycotting Facebook in our millions or our billions. So what do you see? Like, where's the crack in Facebook's shield? And in an ideal world, what do you think it's going to take to make him care? And can, can you share, I mean, you... You've met and spoken with him, so I don't, I mean, maybe you can share some of that in answering Rania. Sure, sure. So uh, I love the question. Um, I think Mark Zuckerberg is a, is a really bright guy. Uh, when I met him, he was, um, he was talking with a group of founders, or a dozen of us with him, and I was the only media 
person there, but you know, he switched from big data to artificial intelligence to media to me. He is exactly who he is. Um, at that point, he was a 30-something white male who had never really lived outside of Silicon Valley. And his ideas of free speech um, denied what was happening on his platform. I told him, I was like, you know, Mark, Facebook is so powerful. It determines our reality. At that point, 97% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. So he frowned. And I was like, why is he frowning? Then he, then he said, Maria, where are the other 3%? <laughs> we laughed. You know, so, so I think that's part, that is insight, right? It's growth. Growth comes at a cost. And part of the design of Facebook is to take our worst, our, our, let me put it this way. Social media platforms change the way you think, literally rewire the synapses of your brain. You have increased levels of dopamine. It's mildly addictive. And the design, it is built into the design the kind of polarization we are seeing in our societies because one coder decided that they would grow by using friends of friends. So if you think about it like this, if the, the, the goal, but this is right, this is left, by using friends of friends, your friends of friends will move you further here. The right moves further right, and the left moves further left, and you cave out the center where you have the ability to actually converse and think policy, right? So that, that's the easy one. But to, to answer your question, I think there is a solution. And I more than at any other time, it, two years ago, if you asked me, I would say legislation won't work because the people who are legislating don't understand the technology. Two years later, uh, legislation is a necessity. And um, even Facebook says it is. But I think that's because they've abdicated responsibility. I sound so harsh, right? But we're a fact-checking partner of Facebook. So let me say that up right up front. And we're frenemies. Um, uh, but here's one legislation that I think could work, right? Data portability. If all of us, like if you and I just decide to leave Facebook, it doesn't really matter. It's still a behemoth. It's already scaled. But what if the legislation is that I can take my data, which I created on their platform, and I can take it out and move it to Jimmy Wales's new social media platform, which then gives me the ability to help scale something else. And then I'll tell all my family and friends to do the same thing. Then Facebook or YouTube has the incentive to protect me as a user because they want to keep me on their platform. We have to give them some incentive because look at it. When they spent more money to protect privacy, the market pummeled them. They lost market value. Right now, the incentive is all about retaining this, the status quo that is bad for democracy, that is bad for each of us. So we need, I think, one legislation. I think the other thing is we need to come together globally. Um, I say this all the time now. After World War II, after Hiroshima, after Germany, after the worst, after humanity did the worst to, pe to its people, the world came together and they came up with agreements. Bretton Woods, NATO, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, because it was so horrific. Today, an atom bomb has gone off in our information ecosystem and we pretend like it didn't happen. And we have to come together globally because each of our countries, the vertical system of information is gone. There is one. Uh, a, a lie that's, that comes out today in Harvard is instantaneously in the Philippines, in London. right? So we need to find a global solution, I think, which is part of the reason Anne-Marie and I join, joined this one thing. But there are other initiatives. A, a lot of people have to come together. Will it go fast enough? People say, you know, the tech platforms themselves will say, you know, well, the long-term solution is education, the medium term is media literacy, but I care about the short term because part of me being able to stay free and do my job as a journalist 
requires the platforms to act like gatekeepers to protect the public sphere. So let's try to get an, oh, we're running up against the clock, a couple of quick questions and go ahead. Hi, Jay Gleason. Say, uh, I don't know if you know, but if you want, if a reader wants to leave a comment on any of the articles uh, on a Rappler, they have to actually go through Facebook. They have to use their Facebook account. There's no other way to do it. Yes. But uh, it's not just uh, uh, the uh, social media. Outlets like uh, CNN, MSNBC, and so forth are also spread a lot of disinformation, especially with regards to Russia collusion, which turned out to be a complete hoax and which poisoned our relations with Russia and could uh, lead to a very dangerous uh, confrontation. So I'm wondering whether journalists don't bring a lot of problems on themselves and whether they're not responsible for people moving to other sources, even though those sources may be defective. I mean, they're just moving away from other defective sources from which they came. So, sir... I will challenge just the statement that Russian disinformation didn't happen, which I think was implied in your, in your comment, in your question. I think the first one is if you look at the Mueller report, it's documented. It, if, it didn't document it, it asserted it without documentation. That's an important distinction to make. I think the data that's been released shows it, like, and I can share that with you. It came out from the Senate Intelligence Committee in December of 20. Adam Schiff uh, also has been known to lie, as far as that goes. No, I, I understand. But see, the end goal is to really make you doubt everything. I just go to the facts. And I don't have skin in the game in any of this stuff, right? Um, so look at it like this. Uh, in terms of Russian disinformation, there's a great book. Kath Kathleen Hall Jameson just published this book that looked at the lies that were told in the Russian disinformation networks, and there are tons of them. Um, they are both IRA, the Internet Research Agency, and the GRU, the, the uh, intelligence group of the Russian government. The Russian government also admits this, by the way, right? They actually have it in their military doctrine. Um, I can share that with you as well. So if you look at Kathleen Hall Jameson's recent book, what she does is she takes, she traces the lie that was stated in Russian, by Russian disinformation networks and takes a look at how it was picked up by traditional media in the United States. And then, you can, and then she, she traces three different instances, and I can share this with you also. I, I can put it on Twitter. The last one that I'll say is there's a great book by Yochai Benkler, also part of the Information Democracy Commission, where he says that most of the the lies uh, didn't really cascade on social media. They were picked up by traditional media. And in particular, he looks at the, alt, the right media. Again, I, from your comment, I can tell where you stand in the political spectrum, but I can only show you the facts. Willing to share that with you. So what, is it, what do we do as a journalist right now, right? It's hard. Ah, here's the best one. I will share with you what Yuri Andropov said. Yuri Andropov was the former chairman of the KGB. He's also one of the former heads of the Soviet Union. He said, this informatia is like taking drugs. You take it once or twice, you're okay. But if you take it all the time, you'll forever be a changed man. So now think about our information ecosystem like a closed system where lies are like the drugs, right, or a virus comes in. And there's exponential lies that are coming in. They don't stop with coming into the system. They infect real people. And the real people are forever changed. So we are not going to solve this problem without actually, like drug addicts, finding a way to rehabilitate the people who believe the lies that come in. And they're, you know, again, not talking in any political spectrum, but just look at the writings of Yuri Andropov as well as the Russian military doctrine. You can also see where I come from, right? right. I, we, did, um, we did the tracking that connected our social media disinformation networks in the Philippines to the Russian disinformation networks. But I'm willing to show you all of that because it's, it's actually chronicled. Um, and then what you make of it is also your call. And I'll be transparent and say that while the kids in my family were Democrats, 
My parents are proudly Trump supporters. Um, well, a quick, the Crimson, we have to give a quick last question yes. to the Crimson and a um, quick response from Maria. Hi, uh, Ms. Ray. So my name is Jarmo Laura, and I am a first-year undergraduate student of Harvard College. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I'm also engaging in a sideline research project on Philippine history and hopefully digitizing all the Philippine materials that Harvard University Library has. And this totally relates a lot to your point on historical revisionism that we are seeing in the Philippines that I personally have been distraught for. And I think sort of like an issue on this is the lack of access to primary source documents. So that's what my project entails to do. And I'm wondering, this relates to a two-part question on this. Oh, first, um, so when you're saying, sorry, um, so when you're saying on how we need to have the presence of journalists of defending the truth and facts in these new information ecosystems of uh, social media, how could we go beyond presence into education and making sure that people who would be most likely susceptible to sticking with their own forms of news see facts and pursue it instead of just having this group polarization that we are seeing in our country and in our world in the Philippines today. And then lastly, I'm just wondering what drives you? Since you're being here with us, you have shown a lot of drive, optimism, and even courage to endure all of this. And I would be ashamed to say that as a Filipino and seeing what's happening in my country, I've been really ashamed that so many things that are happening, that there's a lot of not only cynicism, but also anger and dejection. So can you tell us what drives you? Thank you so much. I have two minutes to answer that very complicated two-part question. So minute number one is we will never solve the problem because this is, there's a book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Journalism and thinking is a thinking slow process. But social media and our information ecosystem today is a thinking fast process, which is why I lay the blame very quickly on the design of the beginning of our information ecosystem. Last year, 69% of Americans, you got your information from, from social media. So thinking fast, thinking slow. We cannot fight this. There must be something done by the groups that created this. On the other part, we have to build communities of action. This is the time our values matter. We need to fight while we are strong. Um, and I'm not, I don't wanna fight you. I don't wanna fight what you believe. I just wanna stand up for the rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution, both the Philippines and the United States. Hit it. <laughs> Maria, thank you so much.